Good morning. We'll call to order public meeting 253. Uh, up first, approval of the minutes. Commissioner Stebbins. Sure, Madam Chair. The uh, minutes from the September 27, 2018 meeting are in your packet. Um, I went through these already, but I noticed there was a, just a small error under 1201 for the Northeast Center for Tradeswomen Equity Update. They talk about the Tradeswomen Tuesdays being offered by Boston and Springfield. It's really offered in Boston and Springfield. The municipalities really don't offer those, but that's the location. But other than that, um, I would move that we approve the minutes subject to any other uh, immaterial errors or grammatical changes. I second that. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Four zero. Uh, Executive Director Bedrosian, your administrative update. Yes. Good morning, Commissioners. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, I, I have uh, just a housekeeping agenda items. Um, some uh, leftover items from end of year stuff that we will get to uh, at the next meeting, I think, will be the year end financial closeout. Uh, whether I think um, our CIFO will be able to be there, but if not, we'll get a substitute and get that done. We should get that off the books. And I know uh, Commissioner Zuniga is also working on the annual report, so mm -hmm. we'll, we'll keep on we'll keep on those two things. Um, for today's agenda, just a couple of uh, adjustments. Item number four is off. There was a, uh, a last minute hiccup with that, so that is off. And. Um, on item number five, one of our presenters is has a is stuck in a little bit of traffic, so we're going to move uh, Director Griffin up and adjust, and uh, we might have to take a short break just uh, so we can get to uh, item number five when our folks are here. So that is all I have. We do have one other item though under my uh, that I will turn over to the commission to formalize. I think an action that they. Uh, took last meeting. Okay. So that item that uh, the executive director is referring to is the confirmation of the interim chair. Uh, well, I would like to uh, move um, because I started that motion actually two weeks ago and was told <laughs> that uh, that item was not on the agenda as a vote. It is now as a vote. It is perhaps a, a formality, but it's an affirmation of um, the conversation we had um, uh, two weeks ago to designate uh, you as, as chair of the commission, um, Commissioner Cameron, uh, on an interim basis. So I would move that the commission um, uh, uh, designate uh, Commissioner Gail Cameron as the interim chair uh, of the commission until such time as the governor designates the permanent chair of the commission as it's as is uh, his or her uh, statutory um, obligation. Second. Uh, <laughs> you, you doubling down or you uh, backing no. out? <laughs> a little, no. A little uh, uh, is there any discussion before we close the vote? And uh, I suspect I should abstain from this vote. So, uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Three zero. Um, again, I just uh, I thank you for your confidence. We are working on an interim basis. We all realize that we will continue to work collaboratively as we always have with staff and, and among the four of us. So, um, uh, you know, I'm very confident in, in our work. We have important work going forward, and, and we will get it done. So, thank you all. Thank you. Uh, moving on. Now we'll move to um, workforce supplier and diversity development. Director Griffin. Congratulations, Interim Chair Cameron. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I'm here to um, present information on the Encore Boston Harbor vendor plan. Um, we have put the plan up for public comment, and I just wanted to give a little background um, for both you and, um, and our listeners um, here today. Um, licensees are all required to submit an affirmative action program for equal opportunity. 
um, for minority women and veteran business enterprises for the provision of goods and services procured by the gaming establishment. As per license condition 11, the plan shall include a robust public events and outreach component to those businesses. And also in accordance with um, chapter 23K21, the affirmative marketing program shall identify specific goals for the utilization of minority business enterprises, women business enterprises, and veteran business enterprises. Uh, um, pursuant to license condition 16, Encore Boston Harbor shall submit a plan to identify local vendors as well in conjunction um, with um, a vendor advisory team um, identified by the commission. So um, no action is expected from the commission today. Um, um, commission staff have posted this plan uh, and it will be up for public comment until 3 p.m. on Friday, October 19th. Encore Boston Harbor representatives are um, currently scheduled to present the plan to the commission um, for vote on Thursday, October 26th. Um, so I, I also um, just wanted to mention that um, the, the public outreach portion of the plan is taking place. Encore has um, already had three vendor fairs that focus on various um, purchasing items. And today, going on today from 10 until 12 um, in Somerville at the Holiday Inn, um, maintenance services. And this is um, everything from locksmithing, pest control, painting, water treatment, window washing, um, carpentry, um, all of those um, vendor types um, are expected to, um, to go to the vendor fair today. And then next Wednesday, there's another vendor fair focused on hotel operations, retail, and transportation over in Cambridge at the Royal Sinesta. Um, so again, on our website, um, we welcome public comments on the plan. Um, and um, any questions? I had uh, just um, two, a quick question, a quick point. Um, have you, I know it's up for public comment, have we specifically invited members of the vendor advisory team through email or what have you to go and review the plan and offer their comments? Yes. Um, I sent the plan out to about 30 or so um, uh, representatives from various business groups that um, we've worked with in the past, some that we haven't, um, and I'm waiting for them to respond. Okay. And uh, just a note, I, I, I see that we asked for this back on June 22nd, and they need to to respond within 90 days, and it looks like they, they came in just under the wire. Um, yes, they came in um, within the allotted time period required by, by law, okay. and, um, and they have um, also um, submitted um, a revision based on staff comments. Um, so the, the plan that is posted um, has some changes to the original, and we anticipate based on um, feedback from public comments that they may want to, you know, take those into consideration as well. Okay. Thank you. So will we be talking about those uh, changes and updates uh, uh, or highlights at that October 26 meeting that you uh, that you mentioned? So I'll ask Encore. Um, let me back up. I will um, feed the public comments as they come in to Encore, and um, we will ask Encore to submit um, a clean version and a track change version, should they uh, want to make changes, um, and you'll vote on that. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. But uh, we had seen uh, a version of this document uh, before, right? I was uh, just reading it recently and I, it, it just rang a little familiar, which is, you know, actually, positive. Actually, uh, the, um, the version in your packet is yeah. the um, revised version. And I'll just say that they increased their, um, their goals and they made um, other non-material um, changes to, um, you know, but I think the, um, the positive um, and the most material is they increase their goals for um, minority and, and women-owned businesses. Great. So. So the next time they'll be in to present and we'll be able to um, ask some questions at that time. Sure, Great. yes. Um, David Granada and, um, and other Encore folks will be in to, to um, present the plan and give you background and, and also update you on their efforts to outreach to um, local and um, diverse vendors. Great, anything else? Just if they're making changes, how far in advance of the, I think it's Thursday the 25th, how far in advance of that meeting would we be able to see any revisions? Um, I think we can um, we can work it out so that you see um, maybe most of the revisions unless there's a late breaking. You know, that's why we posted the plan early. We're hoping to get, um, and that's why we're talking about it today to get many of the revisions or or su suggestions early. Um, but we'll make sure you get uh, as early as possible, Commissioner. Thank you, Director. Do one Great. more item. And then um, I, I really just wanted to give you a general update. Um, last, last night, um, well, actually, um, many of us were in Springfield. Um, at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, um, um, we had our Access and Opportunity Committee meeting. And um, MGM was at their last meeting presenting their final um, diversity um, statistics regarding both workforce and, and supplier diversity. Um, and um, it was a great meeting, um, almost bittersweet. Um, some folks actually expressing that they're gonna miss this meeting, which I couldn't have imagined when we began these meetings um, some years ago. Um, you know, as Commissioner Stebbins um, pointed out in his remarks that these meetings started and they, they um, weren't always, um, maybe there was a little bit of, um, what did you say, Commissioner? Contentious. <laughs> they were a little contentious, yes. Um, but um, I, I just wanted to say that MGM surpassed all of their goals for both workforce and supplier diversity and um, <coughs> The other things that um, I took note of was um, in terms of their construction workforce, 71% of those workers, of those um, tradespeople, were from Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. And um, as you know how close um, MGM is to the Connecticut line and New York, I think that was pretty significant. 55% um, of the tradespeople were from Western Massachusetts. 35% from Springfield, so um, pretty significant. Um, and um, later that evening, MGM had a construction um, closeout event where they um, celebrated and, and gave awards to um, vendors and, and suppliers who exceeded goals and, um, and really acknowledged the hard work. Um, Tony Gladney, Vice President of National Diversity Relations for MGM International, made the trip and, and gave some remarks in addition to um, local um, leadership. Um, Commissioner Stebbins represented the commission and, mm -hmm. and commended MGM on the intentionality and, um, and the hard work that uh, really took place to accomplish these um, significant achievements. And, and one thing I just wanted to say was that MGM closed the event with a charge 
to keep the intentional focus on diverse workforce um, on other construction projects in the region to ensure that these workers um, or these tradespeople actually have work to go to. And I thought that was, that was great. Uh, so any um, comments from the commissioners who were in attendance? Yeah, no, I think, I think you captured it well. Uh, let me just mention a couple of things. Um, I, I did have, I have had the opportunity to attend those uh, AOC meetings sporadically, not as much as uh, uh, Commissioner Stebbins or Chair Crosby when he was here. Uh, but um, looking back into the trajectory, I, I remember the early uh, struggle with just the reporting format, the, you know, the, 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 the need, for example, that uh, uh, this group really needed to see uh, by vendor, by trade, yeah. um, for the period, cumulative, all the rest of it, that was critical to the functioning of the right. of the of, of, of the of the committee, um, and uh, and I think the most critical part, which was said, uh, um, you know, uh, two days ago, and I'm sure others will will mention it, was really your involvement, your steering of of this committee. In, in this very, um, very good, uh, amicable, but firm way at times to keep it moving, to keep the discussion on point. Uh, because I do remember, it's not, it's not, it's not uh, hard to imagine, sometimes the conversations would veer off into particulars that are really not relevant to that conversation. So keeping it productive, um, keeping it on, on, on time, uh, et cetera, was really a testament to your great efforts, and, and I just wanted to mention that up front. Um, another thing I'll mention also is, um, as, as we look back on, on, on this, uh, and I was uh, looking at the slides and hearing some of the stories, uh, the, the personal stories are really wonderful. Um, some of them are anecdotal, but they really represent um, uh, the, 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 what goes on in these in these efforts? So I think as we continue to uh, operate on 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 now on anchor only, uh, we really ought to start compiling anecdotes and eventually a report um, that incorporates. And, and this is some 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 of the thing, uh, comments that that were made uh, a couple of days ago to report on the best practices, what made it work, uh, the tactics that, uh, that were um, often came yeah. you know, from one month to the next and followed up on. Because I think the, the overall story can be very well summarized uh, with anecdotes and best practices into something that is really an important, an important legacy. So I would encourage us to start thinking about those. That, you know, they are there. I, I, I saw a slide. I remember I remember the event of the two parents, to the two fathers with daughters in, uh, you know, each of yes. them separate, but each, each father had been a union member and they had their own daughter mm -hmm. there. Uh, you know, anecdotes like that are, are really powerful. Uh, and I, I, it's, it's some of the things that we need to be thinking about compiling and ultimately putting in that report. Thank you, I, I appreciate your remarks. Um, I think one of the great things um, that happened every AOC meeting were, um, in addition to reviewing the statistics, um, MGM reminded us by showing us a video of either um, a tradesperson or um, you know, a, a business owner uh, talking about how this project impacted them and where they were before the project. And, and um, that was a great reminder that um, these statistics represent real people and, um, mm -hmm. and the impact that this project and, and um, uh, these projects have had on um, their lives is significant. Mm -hmm. So, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would just like to add, it was, uh, both events were um, very gratifying to see the results and to see everybody you know, agreeing that um, you know, the AOC had really come around to be more of a team than necessarily just a committee. Uh, but I, picking up on Commissioner Zuniga's point, um, Jill did not start off as our chair. 
the wonderful Ron Marlow was sitting in that uh, position until he had an incredible opportunity um, and, and had, to, uh, had to leave. So we say that Jill kind of got catapulted into that seat and landed perfectly. And uh, I've learned a, a lot just from uh, uh, attending those meetings with her. And to your point, seeing how she guides and directs a meeting and keeps everybody on focus and on task, it was, uh, uh, it was impressive. So congrats. I certainly um, remember those early meetings as um, maybe a personal challenge and professional <laughs> challenge. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I would like to echo that. I also got to attend only sporadically, but, um, but I, I always think that community leaders are looking to see what's real and who is going through the motions. And I think that they got a chance to see with your leadership and I, I did see you grow in that role as well, and, and that's always nice to see. Mm -hmm. um, but they want to make sure that, that this isn't someone just mailing it in, and I think that they got to see that firsthand um, with the efforts of our licensee and, and with your leadership. So really, job well done. Great, thank you. Thank you. Okay. All right. All right. Thank you very much. Next, we have uh, res Research and Responsible Gaming. Uh, Director Vanderlinden and team. Do you need any time to set up, uh, Mark, or anything like that? Good morning, Commissioners. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I am joined here uh, with Dr. Rachel Volberg, whom you're very familiar with over, over the past several uh, years um, and the excellent work that she does. Um, I'm also joined by Dr. Henry Rinsky, um, who I, I don't, uh, you came in and presented the um, yes. baseline, um, but uh, not quite as familiar with face. So I wanted to just um, start off, welcome um, Dr. Rinsky, um, and just a brief introduction so that you know kind of the, the degree and level of expertise that's, that comes in, um, to the, the report that he will be presenting on the real estate um, follow-up report for uh, Plainville and the surrounding communities. So Dr. Rinsky is an associate professor of regional planning um, at UMass. Um, he teaches courses in quantitative uh, methods, geographic information systems, or, or GIS, um, spatial analysis, and state and local uh, development policy. Um, his research focuses on the understanding the technical and social forces driving regional economic competitiveness and transformation, and building upon knowledge to improve the effectiveness of economic development policy. Um, clearly, the, the right person. Um, at the table to, to lead this specific project. Um, as we take a look at what are the impacts of opening up a casino on the, on the regional um, real estate market. Um, the report that we will, that, that Dr. Rinsky and Dr. Volberg will present today focuses on the initial impacts of Plain Ridge Park Casino on the residential, commercial, and industrial real estate markets for Plainville and the surrounding communities. In 2016, Dr. Rinsky was before the commission and presented the baseline studies um, that, that largely focused on the period of between around 2008 and 2015, so the period of time um, before Plain Ridge Park Casino opened up. Um, we're all very interested in, on, on, in understanding what these true impacts are and, and the variety of different ways that, that um, we look at, at what potential impacts are of opening up casinos. Um, it's, a, it's an interest of, of this commission and it was an initial mandate or directive of, of the Expanded Gaming Act. So um, with that, I will turn it over to, to Dr. Rinsky to 
present uh, one of the, the first follow-up reports that we have examining um, casino impacts. Um, thank you very, very much. Thank you for having me. Oh, that's much better. I'm naturally loud anyway, so probably good to move this further from me. Um, first of all, I'd like to acknowledge um, you know, the, the contributions of my colleagues at the Donahue Institute who you know, we basically work together on this. And so even though while I'm here presenting, you know, especially my um, colleague Thomas Peak, who has done a lot of work, and Rebecca Loveland, who has also been um, kind of instrumental in helping develop this report. Um, I'll, I'm going to go over, I think, what I think are the main points from the report and try my best to answer your questions about the report. Um, and I'll try to be brief. Um, so the general purpose of this study, as it was introduced, was that in the past, we've done baseline reports, which all really kind of took us to the point before the actual opening of, um, in the case of Plainville, the expanded gaming facility, but kind of went over the history of real estate trends in each of the, the different um, study areas, and then kind of stopped right before you got to the impacts. So this is the first report from the three study areas where we actually had some data after the, um, not only the licensing, but the, in, the opening. Um, now, the report generally follows the precedent that we set in the baseline reports and that we kind of divide things into, you know, focus on residential and then, and then a separate section on commercial industrial. Um, most of our analysis is based upon the analysis of secondary data, and we try to use publicly available secondary data for most of the indicators when we can. That's not always possible. Sometimes the data is proprietary and we don't have much of a choice. Um, but we, we lean towards the public data so that you know, other people can, you know, you know, we can provide the data to other people and that they can, they can um, you know, follow, follow with what we did. Um, we've also done some stakeholder interviews this time, so to kind of you know, after we've done some of our preliminary data analysis, go in and ground truth our results by actually talking to, um, you know, really kind of community leaders and people that understand the real estate market in Plainville and around Plainville. Our general approach, um, I, I call it kind of a before-after comparative approach. So we try to track trends that were established before, not just the opening of the casino, but the licensing of the casino. So before the award was licensed, to try to establish, like, what was the trend in the real estate market before any of this happened? And then, you know, mark, note the time of the opening, um, the time of the licensing, the time of the opening, and then kind of see what happened after for as long as we can. And then we also try to compare that to the, um, the surrounding communities as officially designated, because, you know, there might be spillover impacts in those communities that we expect. Um, but then to the broader region for which we don't really, we expect that to kind of almost act as a comparison group because the larger region is so much larger, we don't really if, expect the impacts in the larger region to be quite as, um, you know, as apparent. So it kind of somewhat follows the same real estate conditions, but shouldn't see as much of an impact. So it does provide a little bit of a, a way for us to benchmark the effects of the casino versus what else is going on in the broader real estate market. And we, um, and we use the state as well, the state trends. And you know, I wouldn't be an academic if I didn't have a slide of caveats. Usually the slide's <laughs> at the end. This time I put it at the beginning, just in case I you know, bore you a little bit along the way. Um, but these are very important because you know, we're talking about very complicated markets. Um, it's not, it's, we're not doing experimentation in the laboratory sense where you can kind of hold everything else constant in a lab. You know, that, but what we try to do is really our best job of you know, identifying the effects that we can see, but also with a certain degree of, I think, of modesty and caution, I think is kind of our approach. Um, you know, part of the reason why the report that we're doing now is that it's our first opportunity to look at after data. And you know, some of this public data, it takes a couple years for them to produce it. You know? um, so that's one of my big caveats. You know be nice to have more data and look at more time, but we try to use the most recent data that we possibly could, given what indicators we were looking at. Um, Plainville, in particular, we're talking like a relatively small real estate market. 
you know, um, especially when you get into certain types of sub-markets, like multi-using, multi-unit housing, not a lot of that in Plainfield, right? Um, not even a lot of single family residential in and right around the site of Plain Ridge. Um, so, so just be aware that some of, the, some of the trends that we look at end up being a little bit volatile because this is what we call small data problems. Um, and then another point that is very important, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna come back to this at the end because um, I think it's almost worthwhile as a point of discussion, is that it gets very difficult to distinguish the, the Plain Ridge Park Casino impacts from those of other activities around the area of which there's been a lot going on in the last few years right before even the opening of, of Plain Ridge Park. Um, if you see my little map there, just within like a six miles crow flies distance of Plain Ridge Park, as I'm sure you all are aware, we have you know, the Rentham Village outlets you know, to, to the west. You know, you've got Gillette Stadium and Patriot Place within, within six miles to the north. It's basically the next exit, right? And then you've got um, the Xfinity Center, what we used to call Greekwoods, right? Um, just down the roads from that. All of these things combined, you know, um, make it very difficult to truly separate out, you know, one particular amenity like Plain Ridge Park from what's going on in the broader region. Um, so, you know, again, you know, it's a caveat, but it's the reality of, of you know, development in that area. So, what are some of the main findings? Well, we, you know, I've you know, to kind of get to the punchline, we don't really find a lot of dramatic difference going on in and around Plainville and the different real estate markets after the opening of the casino. Um, and, and this kind of goes across almost all of the different indicators. Um, so we're not, you know, um, so to kind of start with home sales, right? So we look at single family, then we also look at multi-unit sales. Um, and we look at both the number and the value of the sales. And this, this graphic here is really showing the number. And the darkest blue line, the one that's the most volatile, that's Plainville. That's the host community. And then the, the, the slightly less dark line, that's the surrounding communities. And then we benchmark that to the region and the state. And so what we're basically seeing here is that, yes, there was an increase in home sales that happened after the license was awarded. And it's petered out a little bit since, but still increasing. But this is consistent with trends in the area before the casino opened and fairly closely matches trends in the broader area. So, you know, did the casino have an influence? It may have, but it wasn't such a dramatic influence that it's really beyond what we might just expect looking at historical trends in Plainville and other areas around there. Um, oh, condominium sales is also a, you know, separate out single family from condominium sales. There's really not enough multi-unit in Plainville to look at separately. Um, condo sales, we're seeing something very similar. Things, you know, sales have been growing, but sales have been growing, you know, statewide as well, and especially in that, that, uh, that region of the state. Dr. Rensky. Yes. Um, can I just pause for a minute on the, on the first one or two uh, slides? Sure. Um, and uh, this is a point you made, so, um, but I want to make sure I understand it. Um, the, uh, the y-axis is uh, percent change, right? Um, it's sort of. It's basically if you divide every year by the starting year, so it's not quite, I'm being a statistician here, it's not quite percentage change, um, but it's, it's a way to measure kind of the year year to year change that allows you to compare areas that are fundamentally different sizes. Okay, that's where I was going yeah. to because the small data is always on on top as you go down, you know, plain reach first, then region, then state. Um, are we even though your point is that the trends are similar, are we simply observing the small data big data caveat that you um yeah, that, earlier. yeah, that's certainly a problem when you have um, you, when you have a small baseline. Any change that you have over that that is relative to the base, yep. right, ends up. It's it's not that it's erroneous because it's it's not erroneous, but you know, having a little bit of growth over a small base makes it look like it's really fast growth. Yes. Um, and and 
you know, that's not necessarily why the Plainville line is always above um, the base. You know, it could have been that the base for Plainville was a down year, and, you know, but at the same time, it's more of the trend kind of that you want to keep in mind, not necessarily who's above what. Now, there's some other measures, though, um, like sales price, right? Price is already naturally indexed that kind of controls for the size of the different area, and that will be like the next series of slides. So on price, it is much more comparable in the levels. Oh, okay. Yeah, when, when I get to that, I'll point it out. Okay. But that, that's an excellent point. Honestly, I think I just talked about that exact same thing last week in my quantitative methods class for planners. So. Not we're that any we're of probably at that it. level then. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think we missed that. <laughs> well, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> They're doing homework right now. That's what I, I want to assume. Um, <laughs> So, okay, condominium sales. I think, you know, what we're seeing is, again, you know, the general trend in the study area and the state and Plain, Plain Ridge, um, Plain Ridge, Plainville, sorry, is, and the surrounding communities is one of an upward trend, but it's not, you know, what you're not seeing in that is this big spike of activity that keeps going up after either the licensing or after the opening. And that's really what we're looking for, and we're not seeing it. Right? Or if you think that maybe it had a negative impact in some cases, like you would want to see like a very noticeable you know, downward trend associated that you don't see in the comparison areas. We're not seeing either of those things. Right? Mm -hmm. um, I'm not really seeing either of those things when I look at the prices. So this is an example of what I was talking about. Right? This is kind of the median price of home sales. Um, you know, during the historical period, right? Adjusted for inflation. So, so these are comparable, right? So when I see that right now, Plainville, you know, in the most recent period that we had data for, you know, the median single family home price was slightly less than the surrounding communities, but pretty close. But what I'm really looking for is the trend. So I see a little bit of an upward bump in the surrounding communities, um, a slight, increase in Plain Ridge, but not enough to actually be very conclusive that it's, that, you know, it was really the influence of, of um, Plain Ridge Park, like independently of, of other things going on in the region. Hondo sales, um, I actually see a little bit more of a bump. And so that, and, and so we looked at this and I do a statistical model in the report, um, you know, for this, for these uh, sales value indicators and controlling for a number of other things. And whereas I, in the statistical model, which I don't talk about in this, this report, I do try to control for, you know, differences in the characteristics of the housing stock, um, you, you know, the before and after trends, uh, a number of other factors. And I find a very modest and what we kind of consider borderline statistical significance in condos um, an increase after the opening, but it's very small, and it's it's so close to the border of what we conventionally think of statistical significance that I, I don't I don't think of it as being um, an extremely strong indicator. I think is the way that I would honestly require it. But there could have been a, a bump, and 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 this is in the surrounding communities, not in Plainville itself. And then so we looked at some of the other reports that our colleagues have been doing, and it, it might be that you know, there is a fairly small, but we're talking about a small market number of employees uh, that moved to the region. It wasn't a huge bump, because most of the people are commuting in from other places or already lived there. So there could have been like a slight increase in demand for housing in the condominium market in particular. As a result, we think of more of like employees maybe moving to Plain Ridge. But again, it's not the kind of thing where we can have a lot of confidence in it. But there was, there was a, a bump. Um, and, and that and was just in condos. Yeah. And this is sales, not necessarily new construction, right? Right. Not new construction and not rentals, which I haven't gotten to yet. Okay. But this is in the sales price of condos. And there, there was, um, you know, a fairly substantial. Uh, well, actually, actually, I think that was a rental development that that went in along that street. 
Um, yeah. but, but there are very few condos, doctor. Did you make that point when you opened? Yeah, there, there's, there's enough to do statistical analysis of them. Okay. But not, you know, it's not, um, there, there are condos in the area, right? Um, but, but it's not a huge condo market either. So that, what that does is creates more volatility yes. and makes it harder to distinguish whether or not it's a true effect from a statistics perspective. Yeah. But not so small that I wouldn't even run the tests. If it was so small, I wouldn't even have done it. Um, so looking at rents, and I have some particular caveats of rents because the, the rental data, as we explained in the baseline report that we get is proprietary. Um, and might miss out on, and it's from online, people online reporting rents, which is known to be somewhat biased um, in favor of larger rental units as opposed to, you know, I'm renting out, I'm, I'm, I'm an individual renting out my house, right? Those people often don't um, go through the online uh, rental websites. And so the data that we have is basically scraped from the web and it's gonna be biased in favor of the larger rental markets, um, but larger rental development, sorry. Um, but even so, we think that it still provides a good indicator of what's going on in the overall market, even though it might not be the perfect indi indicator of everything going on in the market. Right? So even though it's not perfect, we actually think it has some value. And um, is, that, is that bias on, on the reflect in the actual re uh, rent? Yeah, the prices tend to be higher. Tend to be higher? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, but again, you know, what we're mainly looking for is, is the change over time um, because that bias would have existed at least for a certain span of history in that data. Um, yeah, I, I can talk about this a little bit more later on if you want. I don't want to take up too much of your time um, going into that kind of nuanced technical stuff unless you really want me to. Okay. Um, but so, so what we're seeing here again is, you know, we have rising rents, but they really coincide with area trends. Um, so hard, hard to pin on Plain Ridge, but certainly not, but we're, what we're not seeing is a decline in rental prices. That's for certain. Um, building permits, building permits is another indicator, and especially because we're looking at residential building permits, is another indicator that tends to be very, very volatile you know, um, in a town like Plainville or its neighboring communities, you know, you might have one big development that goes up for permitting and that just spikes the data. And, uh, and, and so, so it's, hard to, it's hard to really kind of separate this out. And you can actually see that in the historical data for Plain Ridge. But, but we aren't seeing a lot going on as far as like this kind of sustained increase in permit, permitting activity. Um, in Plainville or in its neighboring communities, or at least not to the extent that it's without precedent in the larger area. Um, same thing really goes with the value of the permits that people are proposing. There's a slight bump in, in, uh, in the surrounding communities, but we also see a slight bump in the larger region. When I say larger region, it's really the, you know, the I'm sorry, the, the names of the counties are slipping my mind at this point. Do you remember? Norfolk, Norfolk yeah. and uh, Bristol. Norfolk and Bristol. Thank you, Rachel. Um, that, that's the, what the, our benchmark larger region is. Um, so now turning to kind of the commercial market. And, you know, there are, there is new <laughs> kind of commercial, and I believe a slightly mixed-use development going in, in and around the park. I think diagonally, like across the park, right? Um, but again, you know, our focus is whether or not, um, you know, this, this kind of development going on in the region is, is really due to the park itself, which is a point I'm going to come up, come up with um, a little bit later. Um, so this first indicator is commercial uh, rentable building area. And so here you see this big spike after the licensing. And as far as we can tell, a lot of that is actually from the construction of the, the expansion of the, the the Plain Ridge itself. So the expansion leads to a one-time spike in um, you know, the, the amount of commercial building area that's, that's rentable, that's on the market. Um, and you know, it's, it's been slightly increasing ever since, but really that spike, you know, we, we went back and looked and that was actually due to, to some construction related to the park. It might not be all of it, but there might be some other, but certainly the park was included in that. But what, what kind of uh, space is this kind of 
warehouse for materials, for example, or, or what? Uh, well, this would be commercial. Oh, commercial. Right. So okay. that would include the, I assume that the gaming floor is considered a commercial building. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. okay. Thank um, you. Thank you know, in warehousing would probably be considered under industrial, but I would have to ask my, my colleague Thomas, because okay. he's the one that really did the deep dive into the, um, okay. into the, the commercial data, but I can write that down. No, no, I, thank you. I, I think you answered the question. Yeah, I believe that that's commercial. But this would be from tax uh, receipts, I mean, say, I, from, uh, from town tax receipts, in other words. This data is actually one of the proprietary sources, again, that I believe is based upon real estate listings. Okay. Um, and it, that's from the, um, yeah. Sorry. That's CoStar data, yeah. Yeah, and they, they have a number of different barometers. So, so it's not the online rental data, even though that's the same basic source. They have a number of different products that they offer and they track you know, what they say is kind of real estate, commercial and industrial real estate inventory. And you can, you can pin that down at pretty small levels. Okay. So, um, so industrial, I, we did look at industrial rentable building area in the report, but I have to tell you that there's so little industrial in and around Plainville, I would take it with a grain of salt. Um, just any indicator about industrial. So we do report it because we think it's important. And that's actually where I think, you know, probably, you know, manufacturing real, uh, and, and warehousing is one that I'm not quite sure of because it, it really depends on how they define it. So I'll have to ask my colleague about that. But we don't really see, um, you know, there is some, there's some slight growth in, you know, rentable billing area of industrial, but again, you know, those are large properties. One goes off the market and it can make the whole thing jump. Or one goes on the market and it makes the whole thing jump. Um, vacancy rates are interesting. So um, Plainville historically has had really low commercial vacancy rates. And we do see, um, but because it's a relatively small market, it, it does tend to be volatile. Um, here, you know, we're comparing Plainville with surrounding communities and the state as a whole. Um, you know, vacancy rates in the state as a whole has been going down as the economy has improved. Plainville is always much lower than the state. Now, it did take a jump up in commercial vacancy rates in the period after the opening of Plainville, but will, but rather than, <laughs> But it seems to have gone down since. So rather than an indicator of kind of the real estate market worsening, it's probably more of an indication of some of the new development that's been going on in that area, leading to a temporary increase in commercial vacancies. But then as new people move into the commercial space, as they start leasing that space, then it goes down. So really what we need is a little bit more data to, you know, over time to see whether or not that's really kind of a, a trend versus a spike. Mm -hmm. And like I said, there is new commercial development going in, you know, right at that same interchange, in, in, um, interchange around where Plainville is. And so that could have put a lot of new activity on the market. But then as, from what I've heard, it's actually been leasing pretty fast. Okay. Um, um, and that's one of the things that we got out from, from our interviews with stakeholders. I'll, I'll, I have a little bit of that later on. Um, the lease rates, you know, still so far little evidence of a sustained rise or drop in commercial lease rates. This one I'm splitting out commercial into office commercial versus non-office commercial. Um, but, but not really seeing a lot. Um, there is kind of a drop again in the non-office commercial space that happens after the opening of Plain Ridge. But again, that could be due to new space coming on the market. Um, and you know, creating a little bit of a you know, temporary excess of supply over demand, but we expect that you know, if there is you know, kind of sustained increase in demand, that that those prices will eventually kind of go back to what their original trend was. But you know, we need a little bit more data to really um, to really say that with with authority. Okay, so to kind of get to the conclusions, um, as exciting as they are, you know, we haven't really seen much evidence that the Plain Ridge Park Casino, at least thus far, has had, had a huge impact on the residential real estate market. So, so, but it's not to say that it hasn't had an impact, but right now we, we feel the most confident in describing it as kind of a limited direct impact. 
Um, now, you know, we have some, some, you know, from our stakeholder interviews, we, you know, we have some quotes that seem to kind of support what we're finding in the secondary data. Um, you know, generally speaking, this one that kind of stands out, I don't think the casino is big enough to have had an impact on the real estate market. There wasn't a large enough influx of employees to drive up the prices or make residences scarce. Um, and I think the whole market has been trending up, dot, 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 difficult to attribute to Plain Ridge. And that's, that, you know, that, that testimony is what we're seeing in the data, at least thus far. Now, I say thus far very deliberately because, you know, the way that these developments work is that, you know, while we're looking for like these spikes, really the larger idea is to follow trends over time. And, you know, if, you, you know, real estate markets don't usually change hugely dramatically overnight. Um, you know, areas become more attractive over time as, you know, as, you know, maybe new commercial activity moves into an area. And there was a lot from the testimony that talked about the influence of the casinos on the fiscal condition of Plainville in particular, and how they were able to kind of keep, you know, keep tax rates where they were while really investing in the community and some of these valued what we call residential amenities that, you know, families and other people that move to an area, that's what they like, right? But those are long-term impacts. Those take a long time before you really start seeing the influence of that um, on a real estate market, especially a residential real estate market. So, you know, we continue to track things, but what we can say in this report is that we didn't see like this big spike um, either up or down after the initial opening. And, you know, for some of these indicators, again, it's only been a year, you know, two years of data. So, um, you know, we'll, we'll have to see. We'll keep, we'll keep watching. Um, commercial, yes, there has been new commercial development in the area. That's very, very true, right in and around that, that interchange. Um, but it's hard to attribute purely to the expansion of Plain Ridge um, Park. You, you know, there's, there's uh, the development that's kind of diagonally, I think, across the street from the park um, that's, you know, I believe that, that's, that there's a couple new hotels that are coming online in that area, a lot of new commercial activity, new retail, restaurants, and I believe there might even be some new housing in some of those developments, but, um, but I get that from the, 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 the testimonies, not from my own investigation. Um, so, so, yeah, we can say that there's new activity going on in the area for sure, but again, it's hard to say that it's caused by Plain Ridge Park Casino in isolation of a lot of other things going on in the area. Um, the quotation that seems to kind of m match what we're saying here is the one that, you know, we've had a new influx of new businesses, but I have to be careful to call it causality. So this is not my words. This is the words of the, the person that we're speaking to. Because they felt that we are ripe for new business and growth because we're one of the least expensive communities in the area and we had land to develop. So it was natural that they were looking um, and that it's the only clover leaf on 495 that hadn't been developed extensively yet. So, so there was kind of a feeling that while the casino might have accelerated activity in the area, it was kind of primed to happen. And, and I think that that's probably a fair description of what we've seen so far. Um, you were gonna say something, sorry. Yeah, you mentioned um, a hotel or two. Yeah. Um, I can see where it'd be hard to attribute other commercial businesses. But with a hotel, is that, is that more of a reason to think, or you just don't have any data to support that? Um, I don't, and, and this is gonna get me to my final point. I think that it probably is influenced by it. However, there's a lot of stuff going on in that area. Like I said, within six miles span, any of those could be the types of development that would attract new, um, you know, overnight lodging activity into the area. And certainly the park contributes to that, mm -hmm. right? But whether or, not the, whether or not somebody would be wanting to put in a hotel in absence of the park or not put in a hotel in the absence of the park, that's, that's, that's harder to say, right? So, so there's, there's a difference between something contributing and it seems to me, and that's kind of what we're going to talk about here, that the Plain Ridge Park Casino is really, what's really going on in this area, 
right, is that it's evolving into being a regional entertainment complex, a regional live entertainment complex. And the park is complementary to those other activities going on in the area, right? It's complementary to Patriot Place. It's complementary to um, the Xfinity Center. It's complementary to you know, the, the malls in the area and the outlet centers. These things, you know, in isolation of one another, you know, they, they might not they, they might not make a huge difference in and of themselves, but together they become a magnet, at least if not for attracting more people to the area, but at least for kind of making them stick around longer and maybe spending a little bit more money and maybe staying overnight in the hotel. Mm -hmm. so, so, so I'm being very careful, you know, and, and I think that the quote that, that, that matches what I'm seeing going on is that you know, the casino is situated between Rentham and Patriot Place. It provides a nice loop for people looking for something to do in terms of, well, what do we do after the mall? Or what do we do after the Patriots game? Th these things are complementary, right? And, and, it's, and it's the, the agglomeration of attractions which really starts attracting more people, you know, than, you know, unless you have a monumental single development, right? that it, it's really the, the confluence of these things together. Like the, the whole ends up being more than the sum of the parts mm -hmm. in, in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, I know you wanted to yes. say something. So. Well, it, it, maybe you were getting at this, but it's, it's common for a casino to develop that has an accompanying hotel. Um, and that's not the case with Plain Ridge Park Casino. And so um, in the absence of, of the hotel that would be on site, would you see additional lodging develop in, in and around the area? The causality, yeah, I, I hear the point that that's really difficult to, um, to determine, but, but perhaps um, the, there, there was an opportunity or a need, a demand for that type of amenity that, that wasn't on site at PPC. And I don't know if there's anything that you wanted to add from the interviews that might kind of um, yeah, I, I think this, this quote from uh, the chairman of the Board of Health is, is an important one. He really made the point. Um, I do want to emphasize, though, that uh, the quotes that we have from our, from our stakeholder interviews, um, those were obtained without those people ever seeing the data. So those were, those were conversations that we had with, with you know, people who were uh, knowledgeable about uh, real estate conditions and about conditions in general in their town of Plainville, um, but they hadn't seen these data. So it was really interesting to sort of see that triangulation, that sort of, you know, what the data were telling us being complemented by what the, um, what the uh, key informants were telling us. And the other uh, just point that I wanted to um, make is that um, although this, re this report um, is focused on Plainville and surrounding communities, but as with um, a lot of our reports that have been coming out recently, um, this is also sort of a template for what we're planning to do for Springfield and, and surrounding communities and then for Everett and surrounding communities. Right. And so I think it would be helpful to us um, if you have any feedback about, you know, other things or additional things that, that you think would be valuable to include in that template going forward. Well, I, I think the one thing that you did include were, were the stakeholder <coughs> comments, and I think that's a critical piece because it's, it's not only the numbers, what are people feeling and thinking? That's really important. Yeah. And that's, we, we already have the, we, we have the approved protocol to do that in Springfield, which is the next, um, community that we're looking at and um, you know so, so we felt that it added a lot of value and um, not and, and that the interviews cover a lot more than just the real estate market so it's something that's really contributing to the broader the broader initiative mm -hmm. yeah. well in, in terms of format I have a couple of other points later but uh, in terms of format and, and scope I think it's great I think uh, I read with interest the whole report uh, in a prior life, I was uh, involved in real estate uh, myself, uh, and um, and I think uh, you hit all the all the important notes. Um, 
you know, the, the, the sub-markets, the region, and the state uh, as a controlling uh, factor. It's very interesting uh, to see. Um, I actually remember um, early on the, um, the testimony when, when we were doing the host community uh, and surrounding community hearings, um, besides the usual concerns about traffic and problem gambling, um, the question when it came to the real estate market was almost uh, at odds, depending on who was who was talking about it. They, somebody would say, um, prices are going to come down because I'm I'm going to move as soon as the casino comes in because I don't I don't like it, and, and others would say uh, a lot of people will come in because you know there's going to be more uh, economic activity or jobs or what have you. Um, and in my mind, I always thought, well, aren't those two offsetting in some way? If, if, if they happen, they would, they would, um, what, what we would see would be almost like a, a similar activity. Um, and I'm, I'm, um, I'm not seeing that that's the case here. I like your notion of um, comparing it and, and looking at the trends, which is, which is important. Um, but I think it's, uh, it's, it's great to corroborate what, uh, um, what I thought early on. Yeah, I, I, you know, there's, you know, when we're using aggregate data, you know, which, which we have even at the town level, you know, it's possible that at a smaller scale, you could have neighborhoods that are negatively impacted and neighborhoods that are positively impacted. Um, and they could end up balancing out. Um, now, you know, one of the things that it might be difficult to do with Plainville because it is a small market, but that we do have the capacity to do if I feel like the data is good enough. And I did some of this in the baseline report. I do a little bit of this in this report, is utilize some of the spatial data that we have available to us to try to you know, look at smaller scales. Because if you had negative impacts, you would expect them to kind of be especially in the residential market, you would expect those to be of the places that are very close, right? And that if there was broader positive impacts, those might be more community-wide because they're probably having more to do with, you know, people being attracted to the, the larger region as a uh, as seen as having, you know, the, the, you know, the town's investing in, in favored amenities or, you know, investing in the schools, investing in, you know, it, it's other things. Um, so, so you might be able to get a little bit of leverage over that, but it, you, again, you kind of need a lot of activity going on to really tease that out. But you know, that, that is hypothetically possible mm -hmm. um, that you could have, but you know, what we're looking at is community-wide on net. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And, and just as, a, as another <coughs> point on that is that you know, these, these impacts often end up being very localized and kind of depend on a lot of other things, right? So I did a, I did a study um, in North Carolina a long time ago now. Um, and, and there was a, you know, and, and, you know, of a, what we'll just say is like, you know, what the kind of um, commercial activity that a lot of people would think was just ubiquitously bad, right? But that this particular activity tended to locate in areas that were nowhere close to residential areas. So even if they did hypothetically have a bad impact, you weren't actually seeing it in the data because nobody lived around them anyway, right? Um, <laughs> so, so, so you have to keep in mind. And so here what we're talking about is Plain Ridge is very close to the intersection. Okay, and I haven't worked on any traffic reports, but I can tell you that if most of the traffic is such of a nature that it's coming, you know, basically on and off the main highways and not really circulating in any of the residential neighborhoods, that's going to mute a negative impact of traffic at least, mm -hmm. you know, on, on the, 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 the property values in those neighborhoods. Now, again, I haven't done anything with traffic, so, but I'm just telling you what I know from past experience. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that uh, that point is well taken, other than I have been involved with some of the traffic studies. Yeah. <laughs> and um, it's interesting because the, the local police chiefs think um, some of the traffic is dispersed because of ways, because of, uh, oh, yeah. because of traffic apps that push people uh -huh. away from the traffic, say, on 495 and out into some of the, the communities. So that was an interesting piece that I don't think had to be considered before around these mm -hmm. projects. 
And uh, your point about uh, local positives, um, you know, we, we all toured not too long ago the brand new town hall and public safety that. building, mm -hmm. which are amazing, um, and uh, talking to public officials who, who were around um, that day and for the groundbreaking for me. Um, they were really pleased that some of the negatives they thought might happen hadn't necessarily happened, but yet the monies to uh, build these two new facilities um, were available. So those were some of the comments from both elected and, um, and appointed folks out, out in the area there. A couple of um, questions, Doctor, and thanks uh, for this presentation. Um, is, is there anything to attribute uh, or anything in the data that shows uh, what's a unique situation that there was essentially gaming already there? There was an existing horse track, obviously not the level of activity, but is there anything that may not have adjusted the numbers that much just based on the fact that here was an existing facility and as we look down the line to additional research, we're going to be talking about brand new facilities. Um, is there anything that showed PPC was there or a version of it or horse racing was there and nothing really changed once the facility got expanded? Is there anything to take into account for that or does it show up anywhere? Well, what you're saying is absolutely right, right? So it's a very different situation if you have you know, I mean, it was a pretty substantial expansion, but we can still consider it kind of an incremental expansion versus you know, of, a, of a relatively modest facility, right, in the gaming world, right, compared to you know, MGM, for example, you know, in, in Springfield. Um, and so it will be a very different situation. So we, it, it would be very hard to look at what's going on in, plain, in and around Plain Ridge or in, in and around Plainville, sorry, um, and and say this is what we expect to happen elsewhere because they're very different markets. I mean, yeah. just very different markets. Um, and and you know and the the size of the development matters, and the context in which it happens matters. You know, all of these things are very different. So so what you said there is absolutely correct, and it's it's a different situation when you have, you know, an incremental expansion than you know, an entirely new facility being put in. Um, that's true. So, you know, part of the part of the economic context of the area, the baseline, right, already includes Plain Ridge. Right? The historical baseline includes Plain Ridge. So, you know, it's not it's so and you can't take that out of the economy. Right? So really what we're trying to measure is whether or not just this expansion piece has has shifted the line. And we haven't seen a huge shift in the line. And, but there's so much going on in the region and you know, the economy as a whole, the real estate market, you know, um, it's, 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 um, it's a pretty swift market as, right? Um, so, so, but we don't see that kind of real, you, know, you can't mistake it type of, of solid impact. Mm -hmm. And so, because you know, trying to trying to err on the side of being cautious, um, you know. But you know, on the other hand, what we're one thing that I can say fairly honestly is that there's no net negative impact in the region because the trend is still going up, mm -hmm. right? Um, and that's important too. To it's important too it. because a lot of people have those negative expectations. Right. Um, but like I said, you know, don't don't you know, um, you know, but but. We'll have to, we'll, we'll understand Springfield when we understand Springfield, you know, and understanding Plain, Plainville, you know, um, it, it's a different situation, yeah. You know, I, I do want to pick up on that larger point about the region in conjunction with uh, Patriot Place or the, um, the Rentham Outlets or um, uh, the, concert, the Concert Place. Um, I'm reminded of the uh, economic development white paper uh, that uh, that you led the effort and um, in, in terms of writing commissioner and one of the proposals from that region was to 
try to advise to the legislature about the importance about thinking of this as a as a regional uh, destination. Um, perhaps a thought about um, transportation uh, a loop, uh, for example. I remember that was one of the um, um, the, the town manager and the, the, the town from Foxboro were sort of trying to collaborate on, uh, because themselves they're they're saying this could be a, a situation that together we could leverage towards again, get somebody to stay longer or um, or come do two things as opposed to one uh, and has that positive uh, economic uh, economic impact. Um, so it's also in the minds of at least some local people uh, and they're also thinking about it in terms of asking for additional investment, you know, uh, not not in this case solely from the from the licensee, but from other sources. Yeah, um, you know, and while it's, you know, I, I can't say that I'm, you know, it, well, I guess I'm, I'm okay, but you know, but uh, tourism, you know, is is just one of many areas that I've done work in, and there's other people that I think are much more kind of experts on tourism, economic tourism-based economic development. I think is what I would want to say. But one thing that I think um, is is pretty well established in the literature is that, you know, it's really kind of these this chaining of activities that draws, see, see what you really want with the casino, really to get positive economic impacts, is what you really want is people from further away. Because the closer that people are, the more likely it is that they probably would have spent money in the region anyway, mm -hmm. right? So what you really want to do is draw. And that draw is really contingent upon having a variety of different complementary activities together. You, this really comes out in, among the people that do um, heritage-based uh, tourism, you know, that you, you it's, it's it's rare just to have one particular activity be such a draw that it pulls in people from further away. But if you can chain activities together, it not only pulls in more people, but it pulls in more people that tend to be from further away. And they tend to stick around longer and spend more. So, but, you know, but, but it's a very dynamic, you know, it, it's not like this happens in isolation because you know, you're also competing against other types of draws. But, but that's the general notion, yeah. It, is it is it fair to say in a couple of your slides you say that it's tough to really nail down how much a PPC is having an impact? Is it fair to say that the evidence is also there that PPC isn't necessarily having a harm on some of the data and statistics you pull up? Um, that's how I interpret it, but it's hard for me to pull that out strictly from the data. So because you could have a situation where the market might be better than it actually is, and we wouldn't know that counterfactual. So I'm kind of, but when I look at this data and I look at the historical trends, and then I compare it to the other regions, things are kind of where I would expect them to be, um, both up and down, even if it wasn't for the expansion, right? So, so I don't think that it's certainly not having net harm, right? My interpretation of it is is that if it is having harm, it's very isolated. Um, but you know, it, it doesn't from, from the from looking at all the evidence as a whole and bringing together all these different pieces and combining that with our stakeholder interviews, we have no reason to think that it's been harmful to the market. Right. I, I hope that answers your question. No, it does. I'm not trying to be evasive. I'm just <laughs> trying to, you know. Be careful. I'm being careful as a scholar. <laughs> what we really talk about is like what it actually means to measure impact, right. you know, versus contribution, right. right? And impact is something that you can very definitively pin on a specific source, whereas a contribution is, I think, what's going on more of here, where it's, you know, like I said, you know, to measure impact, you have to be able to separate out the individual pieces. And here, you can't truly separate out the individual pieces from the whole, because there's so much else going on. That would be a challenge with any of the, the developments, to be quite honest. OK. Yeah. I, what I think is interesting, and Rachel, you touched on this, is thinking about we're going to need somewhat <coughs> of a different approach with Springfield. Um, you know, already since their opening, there are stories of potential new hotel developments. So, you know, something that comes to mind is when you think of that category of stakeholder interviews you want to do is reaching out and talking to those developers. I mean, they've got to present a case to whatever 
financial institution they're using to get a loan for their development, I'm sure they'd be happy to tell you the development is being driven by any number of different reasons. Uh, Springfield, I think, is also unique, obviously, not only the urban setting, but the size of the community. And you can start pulling data by zip codes, because there are multiple zip codes in, in Springfield as opposed to just one um, in Plainville. But uh, um, yeah, I think having a conversation about that going forward, you know, talking with our community mitigation folks as well as to think of what okay. the scope of that study will be, because it'll be, it'll be different. Well, there will be more data, and I look forward to yeah. that uh, for sure. Uh, but I think the, the, the format and the, the, the variables the, um, that you've studied and the submarkets to the extent that you can uh, are very helpful. I agree. Thank you very much. Well, thank you all for thank having you. Thank you all for having me. <laughs> thank you, Doctor. Thank you, Doctor. We're on to commissioner's updates. No. Oh, I'm Mark's sorry, Mark. More You're not finished. I am not done. <laughs> um, the, the last item I have is uh, it's a gaming research update. So um, for the past couple of years, I've been working closely with the Public Health Trust Fund Executive Committee. Um, and uh, as a standard report, I provided um, just a general research update. What's, what's been released in the last couple months, what's kind of on the, on the horizon, and what, what has been done, um, what's under our belt, and what's already been published. Um, and that was particularly helpful, especially since that was a group that only met periodically, um, basically quarterly. And so it was a good way to keep track of kind of where the, where the research activities are. Um, the, this, uh, and it dawned on me that this would probably be a great sort of memo or report that I could produce for the commission as well, um, just to provide a, a quick snapshot of, of where things stand. Um, you know, you, you have, uh, if we take a, and so it's broken down um, by, uh, so in the last quarter, it provides a very brief summary of, um, of reports and studies that have been released. Um, it then moves into a, a, a list of activities or reports that are on the near horizon and provides an update about um, what that will provide for us as well as a, a rough timeline of when, when you should be seeing it. Um, I also provide a, a list of deliverables for this fiscal year. Perhaps we don't have a, a specific date when that will be provided or where it will be, and some of the details are missing, but I think it's worth listing, listing that for you. Um, and then finally, um, I have research deliverables that have been released from 2014 through July of 2018, broken up by social, economic, um, uh, public safety evaluation, and then a list of publications where I've where has the work that has been funded by the MGC um, been published in different academic journals? Um, I hope you find this helpful. I'm definitely open to changing changing it up or adding or or making it more brief than than what it currently is. Um, um, but it, you know, when it's it's a great activity for me to uh, to kind of roll this all up into one and to, to actually see where, where things stand and, and what we're focusing on um, in the near future. Um, if I could just, if I, if I wanted to get your thoughts on this and then there is one specific piece that, um, that was released in the last couple months. It's the Sigma Magic fact sheets that were delivered to the, uh, the commission on September 24th. And um, Rachel and I wanted to have a, a discussion about those fact sheets uh, with you. So before we do that, if you have any thoughts about this memo specifically. Well, I do, and uh, I'm a little biased because I'm a lot more uh, closer than perhaps a, a couple of my fellow commissioners um, um, on these. But um, I think this is this is great. I think we've we've talked a little bit about uh, the notion also at the public health 
Trust Fund Executive Committee that um, we have so much uh, research going on that at times our own research sort of drowns a little bit uh, the prior fi findings or, or what have you. And it's important to always summarize um, what we've done, the most relevant and of course the, the most up to date uh, and I think this memo does it really quite well, um, you know, with all those objectives in mind. I also think, and I know you're going to talk about this, the fact sheets is something that uh, we've been discussing quite a bit at the Gaming Research Advisory Committee as well. Um, and I think they are also uh, fantastic. I like uh, that they're, they can be visual, they get to the point, and they can be freestanding for any one of, of the topics. Um, I think there's a lot of information in these two documents that go directly into our annual report uh, when it comes to all of the work that we have been doing at, on research and responsible gaming, um, which has been something in my mind uh, as of late because I'm, we're at that time of the year when we have, are putting that uh, together. And I appreciate any, um, any help that uh, these, these reports can provide in, in helping, helping me with my section of that annual report. <laughs> um, you know, this was such a good reminder of how much work we're actually doing, which is really kind of amazing when you see it all pointed out this way. I was wondering if um, in going through this exercise of kind of correlating everything, were there some things you you looked at and said, hmm, seems like we're focusing more here than here. There's a little changes I, I think might be necessary or might be worth talking as a group about. Um, yeah, you know, I mean, in terms of the, the balance of the types of research that we're doing, mm -hmm. breaking it down between looking at economic, um, economic studies versus social studies versus um, evaluation, um, I'm, I, I am pleased with that. Um, I think probably more important than this is this process that we're going to develop a strategic plan for the overall research agenda, um, where we're working with uh, Judith Glynn um, of Strategic Science, and she's spoken with, with each one of you. She's, in the, she's um, met with most of the Public Health Trust Fund Executive Committee and then other, other key stakeholders. That, to me, has been an a really important process to just kind of take a step back, ask ourselves how do we maximize um, the, the research agenda, um, both in terms of what its impact is and, and make it as efficient as, as we possibly can. Um, a couple things that I think where I think that re that's kind of coming to the surface through that process and I think that maybe you see, you could see it reflected in here if you take a close look. Um, one is, is shifting some of the focus of our research agenda to community-driven research. We have some very large research projects, very good research projects, incredibly high-quality researchers sitting with me at the table. Um, but I think that, that um, getting down deep into the weeds with some of the, the research that we're doing um, and partnering um, with, with uh, local communities um, to um, assess uh, impacts of, of opening casinos. I think that that will probably end up being a direction that, that we go. Um, another piece, and, and I think the, the fact sheets are a perfect example of this, is, yeah, we have a lot of research out there, um, but it's only as good as, mm -hmm. as how frequently or how it's, how it's being used. Mm -hmm. And so um, exploring ways in which we can, we can make this useful to a variety of different people, and whether it's useful for us for this for our annual report, useful for legislators, useful for um, for local community leaders to to get a better understanding of what some of the impacts are, um, we need to translate. It's a process called knowledge translation, um, but we need to to really try to take our research to that next level and boil it down and and deliver it in ways that make sense. So the fact sheets are a great example of that. The, uh, the math at a glance, um, interactive um, 
uh, portal that, that um, Rachel and her team have been working on is an example of that. But there's probably more. And I think that, that um, looking at, at this, this memo and the breadth of, of research that's been done, we can, do, we can certainly do more to make sure that it's, it's being used and it's, being, it's useful. Yeah, critical step. Yeah, definitely. Using it effectively. Yeah, and, and Commissioner, I know f from our conversations that that's what that's what's really um, resonated true for for you as well is that let's make it useful. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the researchers will always um, include their methods, their methodology, um, the disclosures, etc. Uh, but what's most useful to bodies like us or the public health trust fund or really the public are the insights, the takeaways, um, um, the what next or what now. Now that we learned this, what what follows? And that's, uh, I, I know, part of the efforts in doing this knowledge translation, which includes other research types that are not doing the research, um, to try to articulate and communicate, yeah. uh, you know, those those insights. It's an ongoing effort. Yeah. One of the reasons we got the buy-in from police chiefs, and now this is two different jurisdictions, is that real-time information which can be extremely useful to them right. and their communities. Mm -hmm. um, when I spoke, uh, we, we went through a knowledge translation process with the Game Sense evaluation, so the compendium of four evaluations, so it was pretty dense. Um, and it was led by uh, Dr. Michael Wall um, from Carleton University in Toronto. And he boiled it down, and he, it's, the, it's the so what, now what. You know, take any research project. So what? Um, and now what? Now do we do with it? Um, I think that that's that was um, succinct and, and true to me. Um, if I could, if we could just focus um, briefly on the um, on the fact sheets that um, Rachel and her team have have developed. Um, what uh, a couple points on this, they, they, uh, they spent a lot of time um, kind of taking specific reports that have been produced over the past um, few years and doing exactly that, the, uh, the so what. So take it, taking it and making sure that it's boiled down into to no more than one page. Um, we took these, uh, once we had drafts of these reports, we, um, we discussed them during the Gaming Research Advisory Committee. Um, and received a, a, there was additional feedback that was provided that was integrated in um, with Rachel, um, and that's what that's what you have before you now. Um, these are just examples. I really think that um, I really like these. I would love to see us continue down this path of these fact sheets um, that would come out on a on a fairly regular basis. But but the so it gives us the so what, but the now what I would would love to get your thoughts on how you could see us using these, um, who they should be delivered to, who possibly mechanisms that we should use to share those. Anytime you can capsulate with nice graphics, it's so easy to read and really makes the point quickly about what is happening. So I love the fact sheets and um, have to think about how to use them more effectively. Yeah, we, we actually had um, a few days ago when we were preparing for Henry's uh, presentation, um, we had a meeting with Mark and Elaine, and I was actually <laughs> quite surprised. Elaine was so enthusiastic about things that could be done with the fact sheets, and it seems to me that um, it, it would be really valuable to be able to continue to consult with her um, about, you know, maybe some kind of <laughs> Um, you know, focused effort on getting um, awareness of the fact sheets out. Um, there's basically, there's 10 fact sheets at this point. Um, the first two were produced two years ago and provide an overview of the Expanded Gaming Act itself and then of our two, or of, of our uh, social and economic impact study. Um, the, the new uh, fact sheets, there's eight of them, um, seven of them focus on the social and economic impact components that we've been doing over the years. And the last one is actually the first uh, sort of um, uh, synopsis of 
uh, the main results from our cohort study. Um, so it, it, it's a really nice little package to sort of say, hey, this is what we've been doing for the last five years um, into 10 pages, uh, which is not a scholarly way to go, but it's a really important way to, to share information with people. But I think it would be helpful to us as a research team to sort of, you know, sit down with Elaine and, and think about, you know, where do we think these fact sheets might be the most valuable? Um, and who would be interested in the kind of information that we have to offer? Yeah, and I'm thinking other regulators. It's, um, I, I've, you know, been to a number of different gaming conferences and it is something uh, other regulators are interested in, the work that we're doing, the research. Right. And um, this is a great way to explain it, use it in a presentation, be able to hand it out so it's easily understood, mm -hmm. the work we're doing. Mm -hmm. So I, I can see that as one area that will help, rather than me sitting there talking about the work and, you know, trying to explain that these are just so easily understood and really make the point. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I actually also I get excited about uh, the so what part. I'm thinking of the GPAC and the legislature as audiences as well, because after all, a lot of this is meant to go back to them and ultimately provide recommendations, if any, for uh, legislative action, uh, for example. But just just the update of what what we're doing is 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 important. I. Uh, I, my excitement is comes when 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 we get insights like uh, there's there's a particular finding and I'm thinking there's high gambling participation that came from the baseline study, and then elsewhere uh, we see that there's little awareness of educational campaigns. So when you put those together, you know, that then then the focus should be the call to action is there should be an emphasis into. Um, educational resources and connecting, you know, people and, and, and what have you, because not only that, that's happening prior to the introduction of casinos, and we're also going to see what happens uh, uh, further. Hence, in other words, the, the, the call for mitigation, the, the, the what we have as a resource in the public health trust fund or even in, uh, in other, um, other, other areas like mitigation, community mitigation, or, or, or the casinos themselves, um, the triangulation of data uh, that leaves uh, the policymakers with the insight of this is therefore what we need to be thinking about or do more of or start doing, uh, whatever the case may be. Yeah, I you know I'm picking up and just point Mark made about you know some of the some of the research kind of getting more locally focused and locally driven, you know. Two great places for these fact sheets are with community-based organizations. Again, I'm, I'm using Springfield as an example, but Springfield consists of a number of neighborhood organizations, some close proximity to a casino, some kind of outliers. But a lot of these community groups were involved in the referendum on one side or the other have a specific interest in what the impact is on the community and to give them kind of just quick information and fresh snapshots as to what gaming is meaning in Massachusetts already. I, I would look to target those groups. You know, I'm reminded of the patron survey that you're doing. You know, the whole tourism and hospitality community around these facilities would probably love to see what's driving people to the region or what other things they're thinking of doing while they're in the region. So, I mean, that's just another great um, entity or group of entities that would benefit from seeing that type of research. Yeah, great. Anything else? Well, I mean, if we think of anything else, we'll let you know along the yeah. way. I feel bad that <laughs> Rachel probably spent more time in her car than actually sitting. Oh, here, she so. absolutely did. <laughs> <laughs> We're around as long as you want to. Yeah. Thank you both. Thank very, you. Uh, again, very informative. Thank you. So I think now we're on to commissioner updates. Anything? I, I think Jill covered it. Uh, it was a great uh, 
event uh, out at MGM, and I was glad Commissioner O'Brien, Commissioner Zinnig, we, gave a, we missed you. But, I'm sorry um, you could not make that event. Um, it was uh, it was very gratifying to see the results and see the just right. positive vibe from tradespeople, contractors, and, uh, and kudos to the team at MGM for the work they did. Great. Anything else? Do we have a motion? I move to adjourn. So moved. Thank you. All in favor, aye. Aye. All in favor, aye. 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 We're adjourned.